Do not love this world, nor the things it offers you. For when you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you. For the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see, and pride in our achievements and possessions. These are not from the Father, but are from this world. And this world is fading away, along with everything that people crave. But anyone who does what pleases God will live forever. You may be seated. be back. Thank you for all the texts and the prayers and the checking in on my family and the gift baskets and all that stuff. Uh, I got two weeks worth of stuff to say today. So, um, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, kind of, but, uh, Hey, I really did hate missing last week. I, I so wanted to preach on trauma and I love that we got to show the Brandon video, but I wish I could have been here, but what you going to do, right? COVID, COVID came in. So, uh, but I'm glad to be back. I'm glad you're here today. Um, that we get to be together. And what I want to do is I want to start with a little quiz. It's not a hard quiz, so don't get nervous. Those of you like me who have a little PTSD about test taking, okay? Uh, We're going to throw an image up on the screen, and this is not a trick question. I want you to just participate with me today for this little experiment. Are you ready? You see an image on the left. There's a line coming down, and then on the right, you see three lines, A, B, and C, I would like for you to tell me which of those lines, A, B, or C, most looks like the line on the left. What would you say? Say it's right. It's not a trick question. I told you it was an easy quiz. And it would be hard to imagine any normal, healthy, functioning adult would get this question wrong. No offense to anybody who got it wrong. I just think that we could all agree. I that came out wrong when I said it. But I, I, uh, I think we could all agree that this is not a hard question. When the 1950s, uh, psychologist Solomon Ash wanted to examine the power of peer pressure. And so to begin, uh, he, he did an experiment. And to begin each experiment, he would bring a subject into the room uh, who had no idea that they were being studied. And then also in the room, he had a group of strangers that were actors who, have been, who had been hired and he would bring them in the room, and every experiment would start the same. It would, it would start like we just did. There would be an image that would come up, and then he would ask them, you know, what is the correct answer? And the correct answer was always very obvious. And for the first few rounds, the actors, the hired actors, would, um, would give the right answer. But a few rounds into the, the, the research, a few rounds into the questions, the, the crowd began to give obviously wrong answers. For example, the one I just showed you, they would say A instead of C, obviously wrong. And everyone in the room would agree on the wrong answer except the person who was the the subject that was being studied. Now, the subject, unaware of what was happening, you could watch, they've done this experiment later after the 50s now in a couple of different ways. And you, there is even, you can go and watch uh, what begins to happen to them. They're very confused. Their eyes begin to open wide. They begin to laugh nervously to themselves. They're looking around the room wondering, is this a joke? They are growing more agitated, watching people give wrong answers. Excuse me. And then something interesting begins to happen. They begin to doubt themselves begin to doubt themselves. And in the end, eventually, they give the answer that they know in their heart to be incorrect. Now, Ash ran this experiment many times, many different ways, and here's what he discovered, is that as the number of actors increased, so did the conformity of the subject. So if the subject was in the room with one other hired actor, they didn't really care. They just assumed they were in the room with an idiot, okay? If there were two people, same thing. They just assumed they were in the room with two idiots. But as the number of actors in the room all agreeing on the wrong answer increased, it began causing real confusion for for the subject. And what they found is that when the number got as high as eight actors in the room, nearly 75% of the subjects agreed with the wrong answer, even though it was obviously incorrect. Now, the reason I tell you that is because Ash's experiment reveals a telling truth about human nature. And here's what it teaches us, is that whenever we are unsure how to act, we look to the majority to guide our behavior. Let me say it again. Whenever we are unsure how to act, we look to the majority to guide 
our behavior, which may explain the mullet craze. I don't know exactly about that. Kudos to a lot of you guys. I just, uh, maybe that explains it. I don't know. That joke was funnier in my head. Anyway, when we hear about tests like this, when we hear about these types of things, matter of fact, I read this to Andrea last night and she said, what you're probably thinking right now, that's ridiculous. I would never do that. I would never agree to the wrong answer. Maybe you're thinking when you hear these types of things, your defense mechanism kicks in and we assure ourselves that given the chance, we would not be one of the weak ones. We would not be swayed from the truth, which by the way, while we're talking about it, we totally would march with them okay. And we never would have crucified Jesus while we're at it. We would never have been swayed off of what we know to be, to be true. We would stand, we would know the truth. We would not give in but we're giving ourselves a little too much credit. And if we took an honest evaluation of our life, it would probably reveal that there is still a lot of middle schooler in us that makes wrong choices simply because it feels like everyone else is doing it and everyone else can't be wrong, right? So we're taking a few weeks to talk about the formative influences that shape our life, influences like family of origin and trauma and habits, relationships. And today I'm talking about culture. I'm talking about how culture shapes us. And I will admit to you that it has been a little intimidating. This task is incredibly challenging because what I'm going to try to do today is attempt to talk about something that is always present, but we're never aware of. It reminds me of the... uh, lame joke that David Foster Wallace told in, in his commencement, speak at Ken, uh, commencement speech at Kenyon College. He, he told this joke about there were these two young fish who were swimming one morning and an older fish came up and said, hey, good morning. How's the water today? And the two young fish swam on and finally one of them looked at the other one and said, what's water, right? This is a great uh, illustration for the way that we are swimming in a culture 24 hours a day, seven days a week, swimming in this culture, breathing in this air. A culture, by the way, that is at odds with the ways of the kingdom of God. And we don't even realize it. Culture is the air that we breathe. It's the water we swim in. I want to give you one example that has nothing to do with Jesus or the Bible, okay? And then we'll talk about Jesus in the Bible. But just to kind of make my point here, because I want to try to make my point. If you are alive after 19... 80, which that's all of us this morning, by the way, then the chances of you being obese are way higher than if you died before 1980. All the charts would tell us this was true. There's more obesity, we're more overweight, we're more unhealthy. And, and, and there is a lot of explanations for that, but there is one explanation stronger than all the other explanations, and that is the amount of sugar in the food that we eat. You don't, you can't even deny it. It's just there. All the research says it's there that when you eat foods, even foods that you think are healthy or that the wrapper says is the healthy thing, that it has more sugar in it. And we have more sugar in our foods now than they did before 1980. And we could even go farther back than that and say, if you are alive or lived after 1957, your physical makeup and body shape is drastically different than those people who lived before 1957. And if you want to know why, the answer is because of corn fructose syrup, which sounds awful, but tastes somehow really good. That 1957, corn fructose syrup was introduced into the diet. And whether you realize it or not, or whether you know why you crave what you crave when you crave it and why you eat what you eat, you have been shaped and taught to crave things based on what is in your food and we digest it and we take it in, right? Now, here's what happens is somebody comes along like me or some documentary or some book or some friend and they tell you about this information that I have just told you and you decide, I'm gonna do something about it. And so you begin to read all the wrappers and you begin to look at all the ingredients and you decide that you're going to now eat differently or eat organically. And when you do that, here's what happens. Those people around you that you are now doing something different than what you've always done begin to maybe support you publicly, but also think, ah, they're being ridiculous. You know what it is. They start a diet two weeks later, they're judging you for what you eat. You know what I'm talking about. And what happens is you begin to take seriously and try to pay attention to what's going on because before you didn't see it anywhere, but after you see it, you can't not see it everywhere. You see it on everything 
you realize it's in everything. And so this speaks to my job this morning, which feels mildly impossible because there's a good chance that as I begin to tell you some of the ways that culture is influencing us, you will be inclined to go, oh, brother, what's he been watching? Who's he been listening to? Oh, here we go again. What are we giving up? You know, what's the big deal? What are we protesting? What are we boycotting? And we tend to think that we're only shaped by the really bad stuff or the movies or, you know, whatever it is, the books or whatever it is. But the reality is, as a, as a believer, as a, as a person of faith, when you began to see the way that the culture around you shapes you and puts you at odds with the kingdom of God, when your eyes are open to that, you can't not see it anymore. It's everywhere. My wife recently has got me on a James Baldwin kick. She's a huge James Baldwin fan. Um, and, and one of his favorite quotes of mine is he says, if I love you, I have to make you conscious of things you don't see. If I love you, I think as a pastor, I've embraced that a little bit, that if I love you, I got to make you conscious of things that you don't see. Uh, the old quote that says, uh, um, we, we, we want to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. It's kind of the motto of the pastor, I think, a little bit. And so I want to try to do that today, make you aware and conscious of things maybe that you don't see in the way that the culture and the society you're living in is shaping you. Because right now at this moment, you are becoming something without even trying. You are. And the choices in your past, along with the influences that have shaped you, have shaped what you want, and they have shaped what you believe about how the world works and how you can get what you want. And that doesn't mean you're a robot. Yes, you have free will to make your choices, but you are using that free will and making those choices within a framework of very predetermined criteria. This is one reason, by the way, why pride is so silly, especially for Christians, because one of the marks of a Christian is the realization of just how much grace plays a part in the outcomes of our life. Do you really believe you're smarter than every other person who's, who applied for the job? Do you really believe you're more disciplined than every person who got addicted but you didn't? Do you really believe you're a better spouse than every spouse whose marriage has ended out there? Come on. Yeah, your choices matter. Discipline matters. We talk about that a lot. We're gonna continue to talk about that. But we also have to admit that we make our choices in life out of a, a, a heart and a soul and a brain that has been shaped by family and trauma and culture. And that if you were born in a different time period in a different geographic location, you wouldn't feel the way you feel about the things that you believe or that you want. The framework of your life determines so much of that. And the romantic lie of our society is that what I'm telling you is not true that you are your own individual. You are free to be who you wanna be. Make the choices you wanna make, that you are, you are not conforming, that you, that you should be your own person and that, and that you don't have to be defined by anything and the only thing holding you back is, is your belief in yourself. And I don't say all that's wrong because people who believe in themselves accomplish more than people who don't believe in themselves. Optimistic people are better to be around than negative people. Oh, that's great but we're not naive or dumb enough to think that the only thing holding us back is what we say to ourselves in the mirror in the morning. No, there's other stuff holding us back, like the cultural norms that we have lived in or the family that we were raised in or the trauma that we experienced. And what I'm not saying is we're victims or we're helpless or we're hopeless, but I am saying our decisions are made within a framework. So this is beside the point, it's not even in my notes, but let's cut some people some slack. Like seriously, if you happen to be doing really well in life or if, if you happen to be disciplined and a good decision maker and you've really established yourself, let's cut some people some slack and recognize that all of our frameworks are a little bit different and there is no excuse for making wrong decisions and there's no excuse for not doing the right things in life but we understand that grace plays a drastic role in who we are and what we accomplish. That's my soapbox. I don't know where that came from. Let's keep going. I just laugh. I'm raising a middle schooler right now. And I laugh at how independent she thinks she is and how independent I think I am. 
and how every new musical artist that I listen to and like, I think I discovered, you know what I mean? (laughs) Or I see a movie and I think I'm somehow like have this unique taste or the clothes I wear are because of my unique taste. Well, that's probably going a little far. There's nothing unique about it. But, I, but you know, I, I think that somehow I have this view of life that's so unique. That's ridiculous. According to the Rogers adoption curve used in business and technology, of all population, of all human beings, only two and a half percent are innovators and 13 and a half percent are early adopters which means that 84% of us only like the things we like or do the things that we do or believe what we believe because somehow we are convinced it's what we're supposed to do or what we're supposed to believe. Eight out of 10. But we're convinced that we're not that way and we wouldn't do what other people have done. But the reality is we look to the crowd to figure out what we're supposed to do and what to believe. And not all of that's bad, by the way. Some of you are learning how to worship because you're watching the crowd. And some of you are learning what it means to be a Christian because you're watching the crowd. But the point that I'm trying to make to you is that you're not some super strong, independent person who is not influenced by the world around you. It's a romantic lie. Now, uh, pastor and writer John Mark Cromer shared some information with this church I loved. I wanted to share with you. I'm going to use his information here, but... Uh, He believes that there are at least four cultural influences. There's more than four, but he defined four, what he believes are the biggest cultural influences for those of us alive now, meaning those of us in 2022. And these four cultural influences have shaped and are shaping us. And so they're going to put this up on the screen for you. I want to kind of walk you through these because I thought this was so enlightening. The first thing that Cromer says is... um, a major cultural influence for us is that we are living in a post-Christian culture. We're living in a post-Christian culture. And simply put, that just means that Christianity is not accepted with no questions asked anymore. It's just not the cultural norm. In some cases, there's hostility towards Christian values, especially when those values are seen as old-fashioned or oppressive. Biblical standards are no longer the filter for what is acceptable or appropriate. In a post-Christian culture, people who are not Christian want to know why they are supposed to have to abide by Christian values if they're not a Christian. And so we don't all wake up and go to church on Sunday morning anymore. We don't live in Mayberry. Christianity is not the accepted norm. And there are a lot of Christians who are very defensive about this, very accusatory about this. They're very angry about this. And I get it. There's a defensiveness. We feel like we're losing power. We're losing influence. But the beautiful thing about every post-Christian culture historically is it's where Christianity has thrived the most. That what makes Christianity so potent and dangerous is when you put it in a culture that does not accept it, and that's when it comes alive. Christianity gets neutered as soon as the culture at large begins to embrace it because it loses what makes it so powerful, and that is that it's countercultural. And so one of the factors is a post-Christian culture that we live in. You're living in that, by the way. So if you're raising your kids, assuming that you can protect them and keep them in a bubble and they not know what's going on in the world, talk to me afterwards. Second influence is that we live in a modern society. Now, technically, every generation could say that they live in a more modern society than the generation before. And that would be true. And there have been technological advancements all throughout history. But, but every scholar and every historian would tell you something significant changed in 2007 with the invention of the iPhone. And that life as we know it changed. And so what I mean by modern society is an emphasis on speed and convenience due to the major technological innovation that has occurred. No one grows up and says, I want to be a farmer. I want to spend my whole life waiting to see if what I've done will actually pan out. We live in a society that says you can have it now and you can have it pretty easily. And if you're getting resistance, you're doing something wrong. That's the ideal of a modern society. So that's the second one. Let me give you a third one. The third influence, Cromer says, is that we are children of divorce. 1988 was the peak of divorce in the United States of America. The highest year of divorce in history in the United States of America was 1988. I was born in 1983. That means I was five years old at the peak of divorce. If you're between the ages of 30 and 40, then that means that you were raised at the peak or the height of families falling apart. 
21% of millennials were raised in a home without a father. Now, you may have differing views about the importance of a father or whether that's necessary, but even non-Christian uh, scholars and studies would tell you about the importance of a father in the home. And so this has had a major effect on the way that we view marriage and especially the way that we view commitment. And we don't really understand why you would sacrificially commit to something that would make you unhappy. Because as a culture, we have turned quitting on relationships into an art form. But let me give you one more. Cromer says the fourth cultural influence that has shaped us, whether we realize it or not, is what he calls megachurch Christianity. Now, technically, megachurch is a, is a church with 2,000 attenders or more on a, on a weekly basis. And so you don't attend a megachurch, and maybe you've never attended a megachurch, but whether you've attended a megachurch or not, megachurch Christianity has influenced you because it's influenced me as your pastor and our staff and our leaders. At one time, you lived in a city with the third largest church in the United States of America in Southeast. And so you work with people who are part of megachurches, or now because of online church or because of technology. And what he means by megachurch Christianity is that with the invention and escalation of the megachurch, church became more consumeristic. It became very Sunday-centric. It kind of unintentionally de-emphasized spiritual disciplines over church growth. And so the idea and the model was come to church, serve, and help us build it. And that is your duty to God. That's your duty to the church. And so we want you to love your church. And even at Hope City, we, we have done a lot of those things and adopted a lot of those things. And not all of them are bad because how many people know, like the church was really lame and we needed to make some advancements. And like, if you got saved, like in the eighties and nineties, I had to be the Holy Spirit because there was nothing going on. You know what I'm talking about? And so like, thank Jesus that like, we're not wearing a suit and tie anymore. All right. That's okay. Like every advancement was not bad, but unintentionally what happened was a de- emphasis on the importance of becoming a disciple of Jesus Christ. And what happened was becoming a lover of church and Sunday morning. And I'm not trying to glamorize the past, but you know, it was Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, we'd come up with an excuse to be there on Friday night and, and, I, and falling asleep in church and all those things and acting like you're asleep in the car so you don't get a spanking because you were being bad in church and all that. That was my childhood, right? And, 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 and listen, I'm, I'm, I'm thankful f that for a lot of that. But what happened is we let the pendulum swing the other way. And whether we realize it or not, we picked up this idea that what Jesus, all Jesus asks of us is go to church on Sunday, help him build it. And so becoming a disciple of Jesus wasn't necessarily an emphasis. And so this is a massive oversimplification, okay? Massive. But let me oversimplify this. We live in a non-Christian culture, addicted to technology that is isolating us without a strong family unit and a shallow spirituality that lacks discipline and depth. Let me say it again. We live in a non-Christian culture, addicted to technology that is isolating us without a strong family unit and a shallow spirituality that lacks discipline and depth. If you want to know at the core how culture is shaping who we are and what is happening in our souls, that's, that's the best way I know to put it. And no wonder so many Christians feel unsure. It seems like every day I'm talking to somebody or texting with somebody or reading a story about another Christian or an influential Christian who's deconstructing or they're walking away from their faith. And we're actually going to talk about that in a couple of months because I want to I want to try to explain why so many of these questions that people seem to have that are so enlightening are easily answerable, but, but we're going to talk a lot about doubt and, and faith. But of course, no wonder so many Christians feel unsure because we're breathing the air of a non-Christian culture. We're isolated, addicted to technology. We don't have a strong family uter around us, and we have no depth in our relationship with Jesus Christ. And Jesus said this would happen in Matthew chapter 7, that we have to build our life on, on God and what he says and do what he says, and we're building on a rock, and it will stand. But if we don't, and the winds and the rains of culture will come and blow that house down. I think I mixed up Jesus and the three little pigs there, but that's the point of what he was saying. <laughs> Jesus did not say blow that house down, but you understand what I'm saying. I'm still taking cold medicine from the thing. So, um, 
let's talk about how it's supposed to be, okay? Idealistically. I love me some idealism. Idealistically, we are supposed to be transformed by the love of God. That every single one of us who call ourselves a Christian should have a transforming, undeniable experience through the Holy Spirit with Jesus Christ. That the Holy Spirit opens our heart and our soul and what seemed like ridiculousness becomes the truth. And we realize we're lost and we realize we need a savior. And that may not happen in one moment, but we understand that this is happening and we are transformed by the love of God. And we are discipled through strong relationships with our church family and spiritual disciplines. And we spend time with Jesus and we become more like Jesus. And then we live in a culture and a society that does not have what we have because they have not had the transforming experience of the love of God. And they are not part of a church that is strong in relationship. And they do not have spiritual disciplines. And they are not spending time with Jesus. And they are not becoming more like Jesus. But there you are. And you have an unshakable peace and a confidence and a hope. And you live in the world, but Jesus says you're not of the world. So you're not moving to a farm to get away from everybody, but you are living in the world, separated from that world because of what Jesus Christ is doing in your soul. And your neighbors and your coworkers are wondering why you can have hope and peace and trust and why your marriage is different or your kids are different or your parenting is different or your money's different or your lifestyle is different. Because... You're being transformed through the love of God. This is what is available to us. This is the life that is available to us. But what does it look like when we don't embrace that? What does it look like when we become a Christian but live according to cultural standards? Megan read it for us in our scripture for the day. In 1 John, I'm not gonna read all of it, but in 16, the disciple John said this. He said, for the world which by the way, the, the Bible doesn't use the word culture, but it uses the word world. So when it says world here, it's talking about culture. A couple of different ways the Bible uses world. God so loved the world. He's talking about people. But then it also talks about the world as in like cultural values, the structure, the system, the framework of the world. That's what he's talking about here. He said for the, the culture offers only a craving for spirit, physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see, for pride in our achievements and possessions. Maybe other translations you've heard, lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, pride of life. These are not from the Father, but are from this world, and this world is fading away along with everything that people crave. So how do we know if we are buying what culture is selling? How do we know if, 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 it's, if, if we're taking it in, if we're absorbing it in what culture is selling? One of the ways is we can examine our lives and wonder how much are we craving for pleasure? How discontent are we? How prideful are we? How unfulfilled do we feel in our life because we have Jesus, which is everything, but we don't have what culture tells us we should have. So we are dissatisfied, unfulfilled people. And so what I wanna try to do is challenge you for just a moment to, to examine your own life and to examine your own soul and to ask yourself, which one of these descriptions best describes what you are feeling in the interior of your life, would you say that you are being transformed by the love of God, that you are spending time with Jesus, that you feel you are becoming more like Jesus, and that you feel like you have a supernatural, unshakable peace and joy and hope and confidence? Or would you say that you feel dissatisfied with life battle strong cravings, feel discontent and unfulfilled and are very unhappy but are yet very judgmental of other people around you? Which description sounds more like what you feel? And listen, I know I set that up like preachers do so that you feel like, wow, he's talking about that. I'm saying that because the reality is for all of us, including myself, we're all driven more by the American dream and cultures culture's definition of success and family and love than we are by God and God's word. 
We don't realize it. We come to church a little bit of time. We listen to a podcast, whatever it is. And the rest of the time, what we're being told is what we want and what we believe and how we get it. And how we should feel if we don't or we do have it. And what gets really scary is when you begin to ask somebody about God's will for their life and they tell you the American dream. What God wants for me is the same thing that businesses and marketers tell me that I should want. And so um, what I want to try to do for just, I'm out of time, but I'm going to take a little more. Um, I want to give you three countercultural qualities, say that three times fast, of, of, of disciples, of Jesus followers, of Christians. And the reason I wanted to do this was because I mentioned it earlier, but I think, um, I think, especially if we were raised in a traditional kind of legalistic religious way, like I know a lot of us were, sometimes we can think that if we're not watching bad movies or listening to bad music or smoking joints or having sex, that we have blocked ourselves from being influenced by culture. And we can be morally making the right decisions, but on the interior of our life, be believing more and more the lies of culture against the truth of God and and never do the bad stuff. So I want to try to talk about a couple of countercultural qualities that really don't have anything to do with the ratings of movies and, and things like that. And as I'm saying this, I hope what will happen is that the Holy Spirit will challenge you and that this will resonate with you. And if you're here and you are not a believer in Jesus, what I'm going to say to you will sound ridiculous. It's one of the ways the Bible clarifies for us how we can know if we have truly experienced Jesus Christ is because foolishness sounds wise and wisdom sounds foolish. Not everything across the board, but when it comes to the framework of life, and the definitions of desires and beliefs. That when you have a faith in Jesus, you're able to hear the truth of God and see it for the truth that it is. But if your faith is not in Jesus, you hear it and you think, oh my gosh, this again? This is so ridiculous. This is so old-fashioned. So um, let me give you these three countercultural qualities of Jesus' followers. Number one, um, I want to challenge you to have deep relationships and a culture of individualism. Deep relationships and a culture of individualism. Our culture and our society would say, your happiness is the most important thing for your life. Which means that if there is any relationship or organization or marriage or friendship, or church that in any way asks of you to sacrifice or in any way makes you feel unhappy, unpleasant, then you owe it to yourself to cut the cord and run. And that cultural lie has now existed long enough and we have embraced it that we are the loneliest generation to ever live. And I don't know how they measure all of those metrics, but the people who measure it say we are the loneliest generation. Now that's saying a lot because people used to live five miles from each other with no telephone and car. And we have the capability of being the most connected generation culture, but we are the most lonely. Self-harm is through the roof. The statistics are through the roof. Suicide, through the roof. Anxiety, through the roof. Depression, through the roof. But we still believe this lie that you take care of you. And there's some truth in there. There's always a little truth in every lie. Yes, take care of your mental health. And yes, take care of your heart and your soul. And yes, don't let people abuse you. Yeah, yeah, all those things are true. But as you look back over the last three, four, five, ten 10 years of your life, have you committed to the group over yourself in any way when you've been asked to sacrifice or in any way feel discomfort? 
When you read the Bible, what you find is that when Jesus Christ ascended from moment one, the church has been a place of gathering. Gathering in rooms down by the water in churches and it looks different. But what has not changed is that we gather together as people. And I want everybody to hear me who's watching online because I know COVID has spiked and we want to take care of ourselves. And I've got a family at home sick right now. I'm not talking about looking out for yourself. But I want to challenge everyone who has gotten out of the habit of coming to church. And now Sundays are your days or Sunday's a time for, and all those things, there's a little bit of truth in all of that. I want to challenge you to come back to church. Not for me. This room's full. Don't do it for me. Do it for you. I don't get paid per head, all right? Do it for you. Do it for you. Be a part of something bigger than yourself. And if your faith is in Jesus, that thing that you should be a part of is the church of Jesus Christ. Let me give you the second one. I want to challenge you to a life of sincere holiness and a culture of self-indulgence. That's a mouthful, and I tried to reword it like five times, but I liked it, so I kept it. Sincere holiness and a culture of self-indulgence. Now, the reason I say sincere is because the easiest thing in the world to do is to make you feel guilty about choices you're making with your life. And so we're going to use guilt and shame to try to clean you up, but that doesn't work. It either works and then you resent God and the people who did it to you, or it doesn't work and you act like it works, but you're a hypocrite. Those are the only two outcomes, okay? And so what we want is we want to have a transforming experience with the love of Jesus Christ and realize that we do not have to earn anything and realize that our life is not what determines whether or not we are saved because we are saved by faith in Jesus through grace. But salvation is the best thing that Jesus gives us, but it's not the only thing that Jesus gives us. And we can have life to the full while we are alive on the earth, not according to cultural standards, but according to Jesus Christ. And so the best things in your life will always have boundaries. And so I'm not standing up here saying, don't do that and don't do that and don't do that because you're breaking some code or some rule. I'm standing up here and saying, as you have pursued everything you've wanted to pursue and broken all the boundaries and broken all the rules, do you have the life you want to have? Or is it possible that the life and the joy and the peace that you so desperately want could be found within the boundaries of how God says to live life? I heard a guy say one time, so good. This is what old people say sitting on the porch and you're like, man, that's brilliant, right? He said, you take a broke down car, you put it in the front yard, it's trashy. But you put a fence around it, now it's a junkyard. But you put a roof over it, now it's a garage. He said, here's the point. Every time you add a boundary, value goes up. And he said, if you want the value of your life to go up, add a boundary. Add a boundary. And so society will tell you, you get yours. Don't you let anybody tell you you can't do what you want to do. If it doesn't hurt anybody else, and if it doesn't even hurt them that bad, you go do it. Don't you, definitely don't let religion or the church or oppressive Christians tell you that you can't do whatever you want to do to be happy because this is your life and you do you. We are the most addicted generation, the most broken, anxious, depressed generation that has ever lived. Because we believe it. We believe it. But if I was to, you don't have to take my word for it, but if I was to start calling families and people up on this stage and I was to call their name and I would say, you come up here and I was to pick out the most stable marriages and I was to pick out the most loving families and I was to pick out the people who had the most joy and I was to pick out the people who were the least addicted and I was to pick out the people who were the least depressed and the least anxious, you know what they would have in common? Deep commitment to the word of God. It'd be so old fashioned. Oh, it'd be so old fashioned. You'd, it'd be, we could make fun of how old fashioned it would be. It would be the people who are in church the most. It would be the people who try to live their life by the Bible. And I'm not saying if you have anxiety or depression, you're not living your life by the Bible. I'm just saying the things that we mock and make fun of, if I were to call forth the families in this church that were living life to the full, the life that we all desire, they would be the people who are defying what culture says you should be doing and embracing what the Bible says you should do. And even though we would know we could do what they did to have the life we want, we would want to reject it because we don't realize how influenced we've been by culture. Let me give you one more. 
I want to challenge you to serious commitment in a world of cynicism. And I've kind of hit on this in the other two, but our culture is allergic to authority. And I get it. I mean, my natural personality and makeup is cynicism and rebellion. And If you want me to do something, tell me I shouldn't do it. Usually is the way to go about it. And so society says, you don't have to, you don't have to, to listen to anybody. Definitely him. He's white, male, and straight. All right? Now listen, this isn't some Fox News rant, some old curmudgeon random guy who's just mad at life and kids need to get off his lawn. Okay? Please hear me. That's not who I am. But as you look at your life and you think about the influences who are talking to you, how many people are saying, find a leader and submit. Find an authority structure and put yourself in that. Find somebody who would challenge you and call you higher and stick close to them. Find somebody who will not let you wiggle and stay in the game. See, the easiest thing in the world to do is to say, yeah, well, of course they would say that. Of course you're saying that, Jason. You're taking the last 10 minutes. I mean, it all helps you. Of course you would say that. Listen, cynicism is for people who are afraid to hope. You want to, but cynicism takes away all risks that you would ever get hurt. And what I want to challenge you to do is I want to challenge you to say, you know what, I'm going to commit. I need a pastor. I I, I need a boss. I I need a leader. I need somebody to call me higher. I need somebody to confront me. I need somebody to challenge me. I need somebody to call me out. I need to be a part of something bigger than me. I need to be a part of a team. I want to be optimistic. I don't want to be cynical. I don't want to be negative. I want to believe the best in people. I want to give the benefit of the doubt. I want to show back up after I've been hurt. I want to show back up after somebody did me wrong because I believe in what I'm doing and I believe in the kingdom of God and I believe in the church. I want to be a part of this thing. If you don't want to do that, there are so many gathering spots you could meet up with people with church hurt and those stories are legitimate. No one should ever be abused. Nobody should ever be taken advantage of. Nobody ever should be All those things are legitimate. But what's the alternative? What's the alternative? Bitterness? 20-year stories of hurt? Let's be people of hope. Let's be people of optimism. Let's be people to build something. Let's build the kind of church that people who are hurt would want to come to. I'm out of time. I could keep going. I don't know. I've got grumpy. I don't know why I got grumpy. I'm sorry I got grumpy. I just, I believe in this. Listen to me. I love you. I'm your pastor, and I'm so burdened by the fact that we are reading a different playbook and trying to live a life for Jesus. It will never work. It will never work. And if you decide to follow Jesus and you decide that you're going to be all in for this thing, listen, people are going to look at you like the people who won't eat sugar, all right? Like a vegan diet. Like people are going to look at you like a weirdo. They're going to look at you like you overcommitted. They're going to look at like you're old fashioned. You're probably not going to be popular. All of those things. It's not victim mentality. It's not woe is me. Nobody in here is a martyr. Our lives are just fine. But man, I want to build something. I'm 38 years old. I don't know, 30, 40, 50 years left. I don't know what I got, Lord willing. I don't want to wake up one day and be bitter and jaded. I want to wake up and know that God has used my life. I've committed my life to Jesus Christ. We've built something that matters. People's lives are being changed and we're smiling. We're not angry and grumpy and bitter and jaded. That's possible. I believe that it's possible. But we will never get there. Living off the script of society and culture. We will have to build our lives on the words of Jesus Christ. We'll have to. All right, I promise, I'm done. I told you I had two weeks worth of stuff to say. I'm gonna pray for us and then we're gonna do communion and Kaylee's gonna come. And uh, Let me just say this. I love all the people watching online. I feel like I came across really mean. And I love you, but I want you in church. I wanna see your face. I wanna hug your neck. I'll wear a mask, I promise. I, whatever it needs to happen for me to be able to be with you, I want us to be together. I'm not mad at you for being at home. My wife's at home today. Hey, baby. I just, uh, let's, be, let's be together. Let's be together. And let's go after Jesus together, okay? Let's pray. God, thank you for Jesus. 
Thank you for grace. Thank you for the cross. Thank you that I do not have to earn a thing, God. I thank you that the life that I live does not determine the love that you give me. And so, God, I pray that I would believe that so profoundly, so deeply, that it would cause me to want to live a life that pleases you. Not because I have to, but because I get to. So, God, I pray for Hope City Church. I pray that we would be a place that uh, hurting people would want to come. God, I pray that you would help us to build a church that stands in the chaos of a culture that is against you. That the house would stand, it wouldn't fall. And God, I pray that we would be people whose lives would stand. That we would be, uh, we, we would be like your word says, that we would, uh, We'd rest. We'd rest, God. We'd be peaceful people. We'd be hopeful people. In a world that's losing its mind, our souls would be at peace, God. So God, I pray that you would help me to be a pastor that can lead something like that and serve people like that. And I pray that you would help us as as people of Hope City Church to, uh, to believe in something like that. And that we would not buy the lies of the enemy, but we would believe the truth of God and all the angst and that we feel the gap between your truth and what the world says, God. I pray that that angst, that, that, that tension that we feel, God, that we would, we would turn and run to you, laying down our life, picking up our cross and laying down whatever it costs us in the, in, in the world, God. I pray that we would, uh, we would lay it down to know you and to have the life to the full that you promised us we could have. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.